car broke down again. I got a car, I got nothing but trouble. Every Sunday, I take my family out for a push. <laughs> the last time my wife drove the car, she cracked it up, went into a tree. She told me it wasn't her fault. She blew the horn. <laughs> my wife wasn't too smart, you know. One night, she went out, some guy stole the car. I said to her, did you see what he looked like? She told me she got the license plate number. <laughs> smart at all. I told her our kid is spoiled. She told me a lot of kids smell that way, you know? <laughs> I tell you, it's tough to stay married to my wife. What do you think I feel? She kissed a dog on her lips and she won't drink from my glass. I mean, there's always some. My wife's father, he just moved in too, has electronic pacemaker. Every time he sneezes, the garage door opens. <laughs> I tell you, life isn't easy. My psychiatrist told me I'm going crazy. I said, if you don't mind, like a second opinion. He said, all right, you're ugly too. <laughs> Kid and I know I'm ugly. Halloween, I open the front door, kids give me candy. <laughs> uh, my dog find out we look alike. He killed himself. <laughs> I was an ugly kid too. I worked in a pet store. People kept asking how big I get. <laughs> too fast for this whole section over here. Good morning. It's Friday, Aristotle Friday, July the 14th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the serenity prayer and the uh, patriotic song of the day, we will have No Free Lunch, The Rape of the Mind, Campaign Contributions, Vivek Ramaswamy, Antonin Scalia, Newsmax, OANN, Sean Hannity, and Aristotle, Difficult Thought Made Easy. All that and more when I get back. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Oh, beautiful, for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the
Thank you, thank you. And now, there's no free lunch, 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. By contrast, human action, to use the Austrian economic term, is not merely reactive to constraints and utility functions, but active and creative. The exercise of the free and creative, and some of us think God-given will that can say yes or no. Deirdre N. McCloskey. Embedded in human action, because it reflects the image of the creator, is creativity and freedom. This transcends the robotic and instinctive reactions that are needed for us to function and adds a dimension that not only feeds economic life, but also feeds our souls. And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative cultural priorities? Bring back hierarchy. Bring back the admiration of intelligence, morality, and beauty. Bring back single-income households, integration, parenting, the primacy of existence, certainty of knowledge, and universal rights and wrongs. Bring back principled behavior, masculinity, and femininity. Bring back Adam 12, John F. Kennedy, the gold standard, pre-HMO medical care, and non-profit news. Bring back civil service, the term stupid question, arguments and fights, the cultural influence of the church and the Boy Scouts. Bring back the influence of social organizations such as the Lions Club and the Rotary Club. Bring back bowling. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Vivek Ramaswamy with Tucker Carlson. I think there is no basis for us to send our young men and women, our sons and daughters, people my age or any age, to go defend somebody else's border halfway around the world when we should be using our own military to secure our own border in this country. And I will not apologize for that. We have to put the interests of this country first. And that was... Vivek Ramaswamy, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So uh, listening or, and seeing on Twitter some of the things that are going on in the, in the House of Representatives, and I was thinking at least the Republicans are making an effort. And then I realized that uh, they need to be reminded that If they want money from me, it's not going to be effort that's going to matter. It is going to be results. You have to get results, and then you're going to get money. The way it's always worked in the past, it has been the Republican National Committee sends you an email, and they say, oh, um, you better send us money or else we can't do X. Or they'll say, don't let Biden get away with it. Send us money so that we can whatever. Okay. Well, that, that doesn't work. That's backwards. The way it should work is that we reward the Republican National Committee with campaign donations when they do the right thing. So they're going, they had uh, uh, Christopher Ray, the head of the FBI on in the, um, um, in Congress in a hearing. Uh, fine, but unless you're going to go ahead and impeach him and convict him, it doesn't count. I'm not going to listen to, well, uh, you should send us money because we had hearings. I don't care about your damn hearings. You need to convict him. You need to get rid of this guy. Uh, if that means that you have to cut off funds to the FBI, that's what you should do. Because remember, uh, by the way, that uh, Christopher Ray bragged about how uh, the uh, FBI is attracting more people to become agents than ever before. It's tripled since I joined the or became uh, head of the FBI. It's basically he's going, yeah, 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 that kind of thing. So uh, you need to get rid of this guy. Uh, impeach him. Uh, to take away his money. I don't care what you do, but it's going to be results that are going to matter. Not good intentions, not trying. I don't care about any of that. Um, 
what's her name, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, just announced that they uh, there's a bill that passed that had to do with taking um, money out um, or uh, su- supplying money or taking money out of the military. It had to do with um, the military having funds um, funds in there for the military to or blocking the military from using funds to send their members to other states to get abortions. Okay, so that kind of thing. And now it's passed the House, but it's going to have to go to the Senate. However, it's also got money in it, more money in it for Ukraine, which he doesn't particularly uh, care for. I'm a little bit, I don't think we should be involved in Ukraine at all, by the way. But that's an, another story. But anyways, uh, the point is that if this doesn't pass, it doesn't count. Don't come back to me later and say, I tried to do this or I tried to do that. I'm not interested. I'm only interested in what it is that the Republicans have completed, what it is that they've gotten done. Then you can say to me, gee, Ron, we deserve it. Please send us a a campaign contribution and I'll consider it. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now the rape of the mind the urge to be conditioned one suggestion this chapter is not intended to convey is that pavlovian conditioning as such is something wrong this kind of conditioning occurs everywhere where people are together in common interaction the speaker influences the listener but the listener also the speaker through the process of conditioning people often learn to like and do what they are allowed to like and do The more isolated the group, the stricter the conditioning that takes place in those belonging to the group. In some groups, one finds people more capable than others of conveying suggestion and bringing about conditioning. Gradually, one can discern the stronger ones, the better adjusted ones, the more experienced ones, and the noisier ones, whose ability to condition others is strongest. Every group, every club, every society has its leading Pavlovian bell. This kind of person imprints his inner bell ringing on others. He can even develop a system of monolithic bell ringing. No other influential bell is allowed to compete with him. Another subtle question belongs to these problems. Why is there in us so great an urge to be conditioned? The urge to learn, to imitate, to conform, and to follow the pattern of family and group. This urge to be conditioned, to submit to the communal pattern and the family pattern, must be related to man's dependency on parents and fellow men. Animals are not so dependent on one another. In the whole animal kingdom, man is one of the most helpless and naked beings. He remains like a monkey fetus. He never grows into a mature, hairy, fully covered state. In his persistent fetal state, he remains dependent on maternal care and paternal teaching and conditioning. But among the animals man has, relatively, the longest youth and time for learning. At least, this is what Louis Bolk's fetalization theory tells us about man's retarded state and never-ending social dependency. Puzzlement and doubt, which inevitably arise in the training process, are the beginnings of mental freedom. Of course, the initial puzzlement of doubt is not enough. Behind that, there has to be faith in our democratic freedoms and the will to fight for it. I hope to come back to this central problem of faith and moral freedom as differentiated from conditioned loyalty and servitude in the last chapter. Puzzlement and doubt are, however, already crimes in the totalitarian state. The mind that is open for questions is open for dissent. In the totalitarian regime, the doubting, inquisitive, and imaginative mind has to be suppressed. The totalitarian slave is only allowed to memorize, to salivate when the bell rings. It is not my task here to elaborate on the subject of the biased use of Pavlovian rules by totalitarians. But without doubt, part of the interpretation of any psychology is determined by the ways we think about our fellow human beings and man's place in nature. If our ideal is to make conditioned zombies out of people, the current misuse of Pavlovianism will serve our purpose. But once we become even vaguely aware that in the totalitarian picture of man, the characteristic human note is missing, and when we see that in such a scheme, man sacrifices his instinctual desires, his pleasures, his aims, his goals, his creativity, his instinct for freedom, his paradoxicality, we immediately turn against this political perversion of science. Such use of Pavlovian technique is aimed only at developing the automaton in man, 
not his free alert mind that is aware of moral goals and aims in life. Even in laboratory animals, we have found that effective goal directedness can spoil the Pavlovian experiment. When, during a bell food training session, the dog's beloved master entered the room, the animal lost all its previous conditioning and began to bark excitedly. Here's an example of an age-old truth. Love and laughter break through all rigid conditioning. The rigid automaton cannot exist without spontaneous self-expression. Apparently, the fact the dog's spontaneous affection for his master could ruin all the mechanical calculations and manipulations never occurred to Pavlov's totalitarian students. And that was The Urge to be Conditioned from the Rape of the Mind by Juice Mirlo, M.D. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy in a meet and greet. So you put me in an unfortunate position. Which is? Because I'm an always trumper. <laughs> and now I'm on a fence. So <laughs> okay. it's awesome. Well, thank you I for saying love that. Your, your, your Ukraine peace poems. We just got to be specific about. I mean, I, on one hand, we're, it's the choice between potentially marching towards World War III Absolutely. or peacefully resolving, by the way, not using our resources to protect somebody else's border. Use those resources to protect our own border. Yep. And by the way, this is also how you deter China from going after Taiwan. Absolutely. Absolutely. So think about that. This morning on the way here, I was reading to my husband your tweet that you did this morning. Oh, thank you. Yeah, nobody, people, nobody knows about it. About it. And so this, is, this is stunning. Because the media is almost in on the game. I know. If it's anything that's against... And it, the, most of the Republican Party is the same place as Biden. Absolutely. Republicans and Biden are indistinguishable on this yep. issue. Yep. Absolutely. And it, uh, it's a lot... Of, I've lost a lot of donors over this issue, actually. Because uh, for whatever... I don't understand. It's not like they have a financial interest in it. So I can't put it together. Machine. It is the big money machine, but some of the people who have lost aren't even in on that, as best I know. And, the, and, and yet, and yet, like, these are the mega donors who are incensed about my position on it. But I'm not going to change what I say. Good. Yeah. Good. I'm not going to change what I say. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you know what? I, let me help you get off the fence in the sense that we share the same policy goals. It's not Trump's fault. I know. But the country, he has some effect on this country. We You're care right. about one country. Right. How do we get there? I promise you, I will take his help. My sister is when I'm in that White House. 40% that you talk about. Your sister? Yes. Okay. She's wonderful. You got to convince her. You got to oh, convince her. You got to tear up all them executive words. Of course. I, I just take a line through it one at a time. So, so all I will say is we're taking that agenda to the next level. In order for me to get there, it's going to require people like us with yes. the same views yes. to come along with us. Yes. And so if you're inclined, even before you decide who you're voting for, help us at least more thinking and debate about that is good in the always Trump yes. community. Yes. Help us with that and I would be grateful. Hey, so nice what is it? to meet you, Laura. Laura, good to see you. I get kind of emotional. I'm so excited to meet yeah. you. Thank oh, you. thank you. Thank you Laura. I've liked it. you since before you announced Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, I love that. Yes. I love you. Now we need you to volunteer for us. I will. You will? Okay. We need you. We need you. What's your name? Larry. Larry, you're together. Okay, got it. We hang together. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I've been to some YMCAs in uh, in Iowa, actually. Uh, We play tennis at one of them. Yeah, tennis. We play tennis at one of them. Okay. So, so... um, if you're willing to volunteer with us, it would mean a lot. Because yep. we need to build our team yep. here with grassroots volunteers. Yep. 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 Thank you. What's your name? Larry. Larry and, Laura. and Laura. Larry Laura. I like She that. said, well, what I did, was we've been pushing you since the beginning. But he just wants to go in and do the same thing as Biden with all the executive orders. Oh, good question. So, so no, 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 no. What I want to do is take a pen and cross out all the executive yeah. orders. Yeah. Get rid of them, right? Really- and so me, by saying I want to do that by executive authority... Yeah, it's to rescind all the regulations that were passed by executive authority, yeah. not to add more. Because that's it's what she time. said this morning. I go, well, right. if I get a chance to Tell, I'll give her one. One, one, two, four, six. That's the executive order that created affirmative action. So I should probably tell her thank you because I should speak more precisely. I have said I will end affirmative action by executive order in America. So she's probably hearing me say, say things like that. But actually, you know how you do it? 
affirmative action was created by 11246, an executive right. order written by Lynn Johnson. So all I need is I'm going to take a pen and cross it out. And she's very so conservative. That's a good question too, from her. So. That's a good conservative question, yes. actually. Yeah. So tell her, tell her that. I will. Tell her the, the affirmative action, I have said that. I will. But actually, the way I'll do it is crossing out an old executive order. I like order. it. Yeah. yeah. I like yeah. it a lot. I appreciate Thank that. You yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Travels. I appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We, need you, we need your help volunteering, yeah, guys. We will. Yeah. Passionate people. And, and your daughter, too. You signed the card. You did. Oh, you yeah. did. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And that was uh, Vivek Ramaswamy at a meet and greet. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. I think it's even a little more fundamental than the one that uh, uh, Stephen has just uh, put forward. I, I asked them, what do you think is the reason that America is such a free country? What is it in, in our constitution that... that that makes us what we are. And I guarantee you that the response I will get, and you will get this from almost any American, including the woman that he was talking to at the supermarket, the answer would be freedom of speech, freedom of the press, no unreasonable searches and seizures, no quartering of troops in hope, those marvelous provisions of the Bill of Rights. But then I tell them, if, if you think that a Bill of Rights is what sets us apart. You're crazy. Every banana republic in the world has a Bill of Rights. Every president for life has a Bill of Rights. <laughs> the Bill of Rights of the, of the former evil empire, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, was much better than ours. I mean it literally. It was much better. We guarantee freedom of speech and of the press. Big deal. They guaranteed freedom of speech, of the press, of street demonstrations and protests, and anyone who is, who is caught trying to suppress criticism of the government will be called to account. Whoa, that, that is wonderful stuff. Of course, just words on paper. What, what our framers would have called a parchment guarantee. And the reason is that the real constitution of the Soviet Union, you think of the word constitution, it doesn't mean a bill, it means structure. Say a person has a sound constitution, has a sound structure. The real constitution of the Soviet Union, which is what our framers debated that, that, that whole summer in Philadelphia in 1787. They didn't talk about the Bill of Rights. That was an afterthought, wasn't it? That constitution of the Soviet Union did not prevent the centralization of power in one person or in one party. And when that happens, the game is over. The Bill of Rights is just what our framers would call a parchment guarantee. And that was the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now Newsmax interviewing Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. Well, they, they target conservatives. They target Trump supporters. And the proof is there on the way the FBI targeted, uh, let's say, Catholics attending Latin Mass, putting agents inside a Latin Mass, but yet not going after Jane's Revenge, the radical group that was firebombing uh, pregnancy resource centers. This is who the FBI is. And that's why they have to be held accountable. But I want to answer to the frustration that people feel at home because I think that's the right thing to do. We only have 222 Republicans here in the House of Representatives, and it takes 218 votes, yes votes, to pass anything. And so it's very hard for us to get there. But I think that this is this is exactly what Congress needed to see today is the arrogance of Christopher Wray and his flat-out refusal to do the job fairly and how hard he works to protect and cover up the, the crimes of his boss, Joe Biden. But that spreads across the board, not only Christopher Wray, spreads to Merrick Garland, it spreads to Secretary Mayorkas. It goes all across the Biden administration. This is an administration that believes in weaponizing the government against their political opponents, not just their political opponent, Donald Trump, but the American people 
as well. And so this is a dangerous time that we live in, but I want people at home to understand that there's there's a lot of us here that are working very hard to bring accountability to this administration. Thank you. And that was Newsmax interviewing Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene. Back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. Now, OANN on how the Republicans can win in 2024. When we win those five states, we win the necessary 270 electoral votes that our next Republican president needs. And I don't know if you saw the news, Dan, but actually, Early Vote Action, my organization, has partnered with Turning Point Action. Great. And that organization has committed $5 million to a ballot-chasing statewide operation in Wisconsin. So we are working hand in glove with other conservative organizations to make sure that we make Joe Biden a one term president. And we win those. And back in a minute. Thank you. Thank you. And now a little bit of Sean Hannity with uh, Representative Jim Jordan and Representative Matt Getz. Thank you both for being here. Chairman Jordan, let me start with you. Yeah. He duck dodged, obfuscated, and in my view, outright lied and did not tell the truth and came with no intention to cooperate or give answers. Yeah, that's why we got to use the power of the purse and the appropriations process to limit how American tax dollars can be spent. That's why we can't reauthorize FISA in its current form. And that's why we should look at moving the quarter headquarters, not giving them a new building here in the D.C. area, but moving the headquarters to Huntington, Alabama. Uh, that, that, that makes sense to us. So we're looking at all that. His answers just just there, there weren't answers there. That's the big thing. And I think the big takeaway, Sean was when he talked about how Americans' privacy, how their data is being swept up. He was asked twice, is the FBI buying private data from brokers in the private sector? Are they buying this information, stuff they couldn't get but for a warrant if they went out to get get it in a court? Are they doing that? And both times he said, I'll have to get back with you. And then, of course, there's what he did with Bank of America, what the FBI did, where they got that information from Bank of America about their customers and uh, uh, purchased uh, history and information related to whether they purchased a firearm. Let me go to you, Matt Gates. You brought up uh, the WhatsApp messages. I am sitting here with my father. Um, what also happened is apparently that call must have gone through that night after the threat because I viewed it the way you did. It looked like a shakedown to me, sounded like a shakedown anyway, read like one. Um, and then magically five million dollars from the Chinese energy company it's my understanding from Jim Comer made its way to the Biden family in less than a week is that your understanding it is and no one ever pays a bribe to not get something in return and in this case we saw the Department of Justice under Joe Biden dissolve the China initiative that President Trump had set up to go after Chinese influence buying off our politicians in infiltrating our universities and what we got from Director Ray was really a cascade of lies he lied about not repositioning assets to investigate speech at school board meetings we already had whistleblowers tell us that was true. He lied about how FISA was used. He lied about how people associated with January 6th were treated. And I want to respond to something that Chris Christie said on Fox News earlier today. He said that Christopher Wray had delivered extraordinary results. The problem is they're just extraordinarily awful. And like Chris Christie criticized us for engaging in fundraising theater during this committee. And I'm not going to take my notes on fundraising from a guy who was a lobbyist and was snout down in the lobbyist financial money laundering situation when he was raising money from them as governor of New Jersey. So I'm more likely to take like Chris Christie's exercise plan than I am his fundraising strategy. He left he left office, Matt, with a, a 14 percent approval rating. And I think he'd be uh, he's a clown. And he's better off sitting on that beach in the beach chair out of a beach that he had closed down to the rest of the people in New Jersey. Um, let me ask you about another line, Jim Jordan, that, that, the, that the FBI director used today, that the FBI does not moderate content. Excuse me. Uh, 
<laughs> what were they telling? What did we learn in the Missouri case in terms of Yoel Roth, former integrity site head right. at Twitter, right. who told us in those weekly meetings with big tech, in this case Twitter, but other big tech weekly as well, uh, that the misinformation you have to be on the lookout for may be about Hunter Biden. Didn't he say that? Yeah, a federal judge disagreed with what Christopher Wray testified to today, and he did that decision on July 4th, just eight days ago. For goodness sake, that's exactly what happened with, uh, with the decision, the, the, uh, w- when it came to the, uh, the, the decision with, uh, m- Mr., uh, I drew a blank there, Sean, I apologize. Yep. I, I got a huge echo in my ear, and I can't, I can't even hear. Sorry about that. Go ahead, pick up. But, but yeah, that's exactly what what happened. They uh, they pre-bunked this story, and Facebook specifically asked the FBI, "Is the Hunter Biden story Russian misinformation?" And the FBI said, "No comment." This is after they had the laptop for an entire year, after they've been telling all the big tech companies, "Get ready for a hack and dump operation. It's coming, and it's going to involve, involve Hunter Biden." And then it happens, and they get that fundamental question. No comment. And this is from the Foreign Influence Task Force director, the lead on that, that Foreign Influence Task Force that Christopher Wray created. I think one of the defunding efforts, Matt Gates, needs to be defunding the salary of Christopher Wray. I agree. It was disappointing to me that my colleague Ken Buck, a Republican from Colorado, a great conservative, said he wouldn't support our efforts to defund the salary of Christopher Wray. I think the question for the judiciary committee... Well, he's making a big mistake, and anybody in in Congressman Buck's district watching needs to call his office tomorrow and say, defund the salary of the FBI director who has shown nothing but uh, politics being played at the Bureau and also the weaponization of the Bureau. Uh, similarly, the Judiciary Committee should take action against Christopher Ray. and what Chairman Jordan and the rest of us will have to sort out is whether to proceed next with a contempt action against Christopher Ray for not answering questions that he has a statutory obligation to answer, or whether to proceed with a criminal referral to the Justice Department where he works for lying in the very few questions that he actually did answer. He, he told verifiable lies to Senator Lee previously about five on January 6th, he told lies to our colleague Congressman Nels today well, when asked about looking at in the, the school board parents. So they, they, they have totally come untethered from the Constitution at the FBI, and we must bring them to heel. And this is just one step in that journey. All right. And that was uh, Sean Hannity with uh, Representatives Jim Jordan and Matt Getz. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, Chapter 5 of Aristotle for Everybody, Difficult Thought Made Easy by Mortimer Adler. Chapter 5. Change and Permanence. Aristotle took a sensible attitude toward the thinkers who preceded him. He said he thought it was wise to pay attention to what they had to say in order to discover which of their opinions were correct and which were incorrect. By sifting the true from the false, some advance might be made. Two earlier thinkers, Heraclitus and Parmenides, held very extreme views about the world. Heraclitus declared that everything, absolutely everything, was constantly changing. Nothing, absolutely nothing, ever remained the same. One of his followers, Cratylus, even went so far as to say that this made it impossible to use language to communicate, for words are constantly changing their meanings. The only way to communicate is by wiggling your finger. At the other extreme, Parmenides declared that permanence reigns supreme. Whatever it is, is. Whatever is not, is not. Nothing ever comes into existence or perishes. Nothing at all changes. Nothing moves. The appearance of change and motion which Parmenides acknowledged as part of our daily experience, is an illusion. We are being deceived by our senses. In reality, everything always remains the same. You may wonder how Parmenides could persuade anyone to accept so extreme a view and one so contrary to our everyday experience. 
One of his followers, a man named Zeno, tried to invent arguments that would persuade us that when we perceived things moving about, we were being deceived. We were suffering an illusion. One of these arguments ran somewhat like this. You want to hit a ball from one end of the tennis court to another. In order to get there, the ball first has to go through half the distance. It has to reach the net. In order to get there, it first has to go through half the distance, at least to the service box. In order to get there, it first has to go through half the distance, and so on indefinitely by a continual halving of the distances that remain. From this, if we followed the direction of Zeno's reasoning, we would be led to the conclusion that the ball could never get started, could never leave your racket. Aristotle was acquainted with these opinions and arguments. His common sense as well as his common experience told him they were wrong. If words are always changing their meanings, how could Heraclitus and his followers repeatedly say that everything is changing and suppose, as they obviously did, that they were saying the same thing each time, not the opposite? If the motion of the heavenly bodies is an illusion, then so is the change from day to night. If nothing comes into existence or perishes, no one dies. But where are Parmenides and his friend Zeno now? Heraclitus and Parmenides were wrong, but not all wrong. In fact, each was partly right, and the whole truth, Aristotle thought, consisted in combining two partial truths. On the one hand, motion and change, coming to be and passing away occur throughout the world of nature and were occurring long before human beings came on the scene. Far from being full of illusions, our common experience of nature grasps the reality of change. Things are the way they seem to be, changing. On the other hand, not everything is always changing in every respect. In every change, there must be something permanent, something that persists or remains the same while becoming different in one respect or another. That tennis ball, for example, which you tried to hit across the court, did move from one place to another, but when it reached your opponent's baseline, it was the same tennis ball that you propelled in that direction. If it had been a different tennis ball, conjured up by a magician standing on the sidelines, it would have been called a foul. Motion from here to there, which Aristotle called local motion or change of place, is the most obvious of the changes in which something remains the same. The moving thing is the unchanging subject of the change that is local motion. If it was your tennis ball when it left your racket, it is still your tennis ball when your opponent hits it back. The self-same identical ball, not another ball. While we're talking about local motion, let me mention a distinction that Aristotle makes between two kinds of local motion. When you accidentally drop a tennis ball, it falls to the ground because it is heavy. You and I say because of gravity, which is another word for heavy. You did not throw it down, it fell naturally. That was a natural, not an artificial, motion. But when you hit the tennis ball with your racket, that is a man-made motion, not a natural one. The force of your stroke overcomes the natural tendency of the ball to fall because of its weight. And this force sends it on a path it would not have followed if you had not propelled it in that direction by your stroke. The same thing is true when we propel a rocket to the moon. That is not a natural motion for a heavy body like a rocket. Without the propelling force we give it, it would not naturally leave the Earth's field of gravity. From tennis balls to rockets, from elevators to cannonballs, there is a wide variety of bodies in local motion that would not be moving as they do were it not for man's interference with nature. Since they are not natural, should we call these motions artificial? That word might be used, for they are motions brought about by men. Aristotle called them violent motions, violent in the sense that they violate the natural tendency of the bodies in question. What other changes that occur naturally also occur artificially, or through man's having a hand in them? The heat of the sun ripens a tomato and turns it from green to red. That is not a change in place, but a change in color. It is not a local motion, but the alteration of an attribute of the tomato. From being green at one time, the tomato has become red at another, just as the tennis ball from being here at one time is there at another. What is common to these two changes is time, not space. No change of place occurred in the ripening of the tomato, only a change in quality. But neither change, the change in place and the change in quality, took place without a change in time. 
People paint green things red or red things green, houses, tables, chairs, and so on. The ripening of the tomato is a natural alteration. The painting of things is an artificial alteration of them. The house, table, or chair, which was at one time green, did not become red at another time without human intervention. In addition to local motion, or change in place, and alteration, or change in quality, there is still a third kind of change that is both natural and artificial. This time, let us begin with the artificial form of it. Take a rubber balloon and blow it up. As you do so, it changes in size as well as in shape. It gets larger and will continue to do so as you blow air into it. And when you let air out of it, it decreases in size and returns to its original shape. Left on the table by itself, the balloon would not have increased in size. Blown up with its end twisted and bound, the balloon will not decrease in size. The change in size, accompanied by a change in shape, is your doing. You have caused two artificial changes to occur at the same time. A change in quality, the alteration of the balloon's shape, and a change in quantity, the increase or decrease in the balloon's size. Changes in quantity occur naturally as well as artificially. For example, rocks on a seacoast wear away as they are continually battered by waves. They get smaller. The action of waves may also make seacoast caves larger. More familiar experiences of natural increase in size and weight occur in the world of living things. Plants and animals grow. Their growth involves many changes, of course, but among them are changes in quantity, increases in size and weight. Although one aspect of the growth of a living body is certainly an increase or a change in quantity, it has a peculiar characteristic that we do not find in the increase of inanimate bodies. You build a fire, and you can make it larger by adding more logs. If more and more logs are available to pile on it, there would appear to be no limit to the size of the fire you can build. If you feed carrots to a rabbit, the rabbit grows in size, but no matter how many carrots you feed the rabbit, there is a limit to the rabbit's increase in size. You can build smaller or larger pyramids, and given enough stones and human labor, you can make one larger than any pyramid that has ever been built. But no matter what you do in the feeding of animals, you cannot make them grow to be larger than a certain size. You cannot make a house cat the size of a lion or a tiger. The reverse is also true. The balloon you blew up decreases in size as you let the air out of it, and the decrease can go on to the point where the balloon is completely collapsed. But when animals cease to grow, they may cease to increase in size. But they do not decrease in size to the vanishing point so long as they remain alive. But animals and plants die. So, too, do balloons burst and cease to be balloons when you blow too much air into them. This brings us to a fourth kind of change, both natural and artificial, that is so different from the other three that Aristotle separates it sharply from the rest. All the others, as we have seen, take time to happen. Time elapses as bodies move from here to there, alter in color or shape, get larger or smaller. But when the balloon bursts, it ceases to be a balloon instantaneously. That change would appear to take no time, certainly no appreciable amount of time. It occurs in an instant. Or perhaps we should say, at one instant the balloon exists, and at the very next instant it no longer exists. All we have left are shreds or fragments of rubber. Not a balloon we can blow up. The same is true of the rabbit that dies. In one instant it is alive, at the next it is no more. All we have left is the carcass, which in the course of further time will progressively decay and disintegrate. This special kind of change, which Aristotle refers to as coming to be and passing away, is special in other ways than being instantaneous. It is so special that it raises serious problems for us. In every change, we have been saying so far, Something remains permanent and unchanging. The body or thing that changes in place, in color or in size, remains the same body when it moves from one place or another, when it alters in color, when it increases in size. But what remains the same when the balloon bursts? What remains the same when the rabbit dies? The decaying, disintegrating carcass is not the rabbit we fed carrots to. The shreds of rubber are not the balloon we blew up. Nevertheless, there is something permanent in this special kind of change. It is easier to see what it is in the production or destruction of things by men than it is in the birth and death of plants and animals. Pieces of wood, nails, and glue do not come together naturally to make a chair. 
Men make chairs by putting these materials together in a certain way. They are the same materials before they were put together and shaped into a chair as they are after that happens. At the instant when the chair comes into existence, there's something you can sit on. You find the chair uncomfortable, or you have other chairs and want a table instead of this one. You probably cannot reuse all the nails or the glue, but you can take the chair apart, and using the pieces of wood and some of the nails, you can build a small table with most of the same materials. If you had not used glue in the first place, and if you had been able to extract all the nails in usable form, the materials in the chair that has ceased to be and in the table that has come into being would be identical. They would differ only in respect to how they are put together. It would, therefore, appear to be the case that in artificial productions and destructions, what persists or remains the same throughout the change is not the thing that was produced and destroyed, but only the materials that a person used in putting it together and the materials that are left when it is taken apart. Something like that is also the case in the death of the rabbit. Being a living body, the rabbit is, after all, a material thing, just as the chair or table is a material thing. There is matter in its makeup, and that matter remains, not in the same form, of course, but nevertheless, it remains when the rabbit breaks up, dies, decays, disintegrates. And just as the inorganic materials of a chair may enter into the composition of a table, so the organic materials of a rabbit may enter into the composition of another living thing. The rabbit may have been killed by a jackal and devoured for nourishment. To the extent that the jackal is able to assimilate what it eats, the organic materials of the rabbit enter into the bone, flesh, and muscle of the jackal. Modern science has a name for what is going on here, a name that Aristotle did not use. We call it the conservation of matter. However it is referred to, the point is that something persists in the special kind of change that is coming to be and passing away. That something, in the case of artificial things such as tables and chairs, consists of the materials out of which they are made. In man-made productions, we can usually identify what these materials are, these particular pieces of wood, these particular nails. It is not always as easy to identify the particular unit or units of matter that persist when one animal eats another or when living things die. But there can be no doubt that in all instances of coming to be and passing away, both natural and artificial, either matter itself or materials of a certain kind undergo transformation. What is meant by matter itself as contrasted with materials of a certain kind? Human beings in making or destroying artificial things, never work with matter itself, but only with materials of a certain kind. Does nature, unlike man, work with matter itself? If so, then that which persists or remains the subject of change in artificial production and destruction is not the same as that which persists or remains the subject of change in natural coming to be and passing away. Similar, but not the same. The transformation of identifiable materials in human production and destruction is only like, but not identical with, the transformation of matter in natural coming to be and passing away. Nevertheless, the similarity or likeness may help us to understand what happens when, in nature, things come to be and pass away. We will look into this more closely in the following chapters. And that was chapter 5 from uh, Aristotle for Everybody, Difficult Thought Made Easy by Mortimer Adler. Back in a minute.
Thank you, thank you. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all of the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. And until next time, be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.